Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. It's Patrick here at QDABRA, and today we're doing part two of our InfoPath surveys. Uh, we are recording this uh, session, so if you do not have audio, <laughs> you can't hear me, um, but you will be able to uh, go to YouTube afterwards and re re uh, rewatch the webinar. Um, we have been trying link the last few days, last few weeks here. Actually, last week was our first trial uh, of link um, because Microsoft is um, is no longer continuing live meeting. We have been told we need to move to link, so we've been doing that. It um, there are a few kinks with link. We uh, we have people who don't have audio, and uh, the, the solution is to make sure you install the the link attendee client, not the web app, and then you will have audio. And it looks like most of you have audio this morning. Thank you for doing that. Um, and uh, anyway, today we are going to be uh, doing another short and concise, you know, brief and to the point webinar for you, really talking about you know surveys where we left off last week. Last week, uh, those of you will, who were here will recall uh, we looked at a simple email survey form, and this week what we're going to do is take it a step further and uh, really talk about um, how you would add answers to it, different answer types. We're going to do conditional hide-and-show for questions, and we're also going to show you a, a, a neat technique for emailing uh, an XML form that can be opened on the client. Um, so, and I'll go over those more in a minute. Once again, I have these three slides here for best practices, and I want to go over these as well. This this webinar this morning will probably be shorter than the ones in the past, um, but maybe I'll go longer if we have questions. Um, best practice for surveys, you want, I'm just going to re rehash this from last week, um, but you want a data-driven design, and that will save you time. In other words, don't create a one XSN, one form template for every single survey you're creating because that's going to lead to a, a maintenance nightmare. Plus, it won't allow you to report on the data across surveys. So you want to use two forms. We have a config form. We'll show you that in a second, and a filler form. The config form manages your questions. The filler, uh, which can be used in the browser as well. Actually, the one we're showing you today is email version, so you have to have the client. But, um, but it, next week, the following week, we'll be showing you SharePoint versions as well that use the browser, the InfoPath browser. Um, Actually, it's called the uh, um, <laughs> it's called Empath Form Services. It runs in SharePoint and it allows you to, to fill out the form using your browser, Safari, um, Mozilla, and Firefox, of course, your next floor. Um, so uh, the config form, though, it manages your questions. Filler form is what what you actually fill out um, to fill out the survey. Um, you're going to be copying questions from the secondary data source. So the config form has a secondary data source in it. We'll see that in a second. And um, actually, I'll show you right now. So here is my config form. And this config form, when I preview it, will show you the, the list of questions I have for this survey. And what I've done here, you notice that the, the preview actually uh, lists a bunch of questions already. Uh, and the reason why is because I've got a preview configured to automatically open a, a sample file. The way you do that is you go into form options and underneath preview, you've got this ability to give it the name of a sample XML file. And that's what I've done here. And that's why when we open the form, it is opening with data in it. Uh, so this is my, my, my common questions V2 for path form development. I've got four questions in here. And um, what I want to show, though, is that uh, this data here uh, is what's going to be saved out and used in my filler form. These are my questions. This is my question editor. I've got another form I'm using to fill out the, the, the surveys. And this form takes that those questions, and here's the preview, and it, it displays them. Uh, people can fill out these questions, obviously. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about this in a second. Um, but what I wanted to show you was that this config file, how is it added? We've added this config data, the questions, that is, as a data connection here. You can see that I've got just two data connections for my filler form, my survey form. I've got the questions, 
and that's that XML file that we're generating from the question editor form. And I have my email submit because this is an email form, we're just going to be submitting it. So that, that's one technique that you definitely want to use with your survey forms. And survey forms are kind of a common design pattern. You can have a checklist, you can have a questionnaire, any kind of form that's going to be asking people questions. It could be a diagnostic checklist, for example. Um, it could be a construction checklist. It could be um, a quiz. You know, any, anything where you're asking questions of the, um, the user is what we call a survey form. Second best practice is to use question IDs. Uh, the reason why we want to use question IDs is so that we can uh, support lots of, of uh, surveys, basically. In other words, um, every survey will have a bunch of questions in it. We want to be able to, um, to essentially, um, I guess, um, monitor or, or manage these questions amongst the surveys. Uh, and we also want to use the question ID to handle conditionality. So you'll see here in the question editor form, I have uh, some questions here have conditionality. So this, this question here, how many fields will the form have? This is underneath this first question category email form. So we're, we're asking the customer, is this going to be an email form or this is a form that we're going to use, for example, to, uh, to ascertain, to you know, figure out what the customer needs. This is a very simple survey. It's only four questions. It's really not complete. But the survey idea here is that we're asking our potential consulting customer whether they're going to need an email form, a full trust form, or whatever. Okay, um, so it's an incomplete survey, but you get the idea. Um, and we've got questions. Once they answer this question, um, you know, we've got other questions. Well, is, is Outlook folders, uh, are you going to use Outlook to view the data? Um, and then um, another question is, does the form have a data source? And if it does, um, then we'll, we'll display how many fields will the form have. Now this, this question actually is, is going to be uh, conditioned on its parent. So you see here we've added, actually added a condition for the third question, which is the one above it. And if the answer value is no, then we're going to, uh, we're going to hide uh, the, um, the form, hide the question. Um, and so that's how we're using conditionality here. You can see we have other questions that have conditionality. Here, um, the views, how many views will the form have? We're only showing that if, um, if the answer to, to this question here is, is uh, you know, does the form have views, is yes. That's another very simple conditional one. Um, and then there's some more complex ones down here, but um, for example, this one down below here, um, we're asking, you know, what version of SharePoint? Oh, we're always showing this. The answer doesn't have to equal anything. Um, but you can see here that we've added conditions. We've added four conditions, five conditions to our form uh, for these sub-questions. And I'll show you these in a minute in the question, in the filler for the survey. So that's the second best practice is to use question IDs um, because it allows you to, it allows you to reference those questions to create conditionality. In other words, hide show. Um, you don't want sometimes to show certain questions unless the answer for another question is, you know, a certain value. And that's how we're using question IDs. The way you do it is, is you create that question ID uh, using either a, some kind of a, a date timestamp or a substring. And what we're using in this example is we're using actually the date timestamp. You can see here that um, 2000, what is it here? It's, 2012-06-05 is the question, and then we have a three after it. So that's what we're using, that first prefix there for our question ID. And you can pick anything. We don't have to have a colon in between the date and the, the number here. You could, you could do something else, like you could have your own uh, formatted string. It doesn't have to look like ours. Third best practice is to, um, is, is to scale out your form, is, is to think about how many people are going to fill out your form. If you're going to have just one person creating the, the, the survey, that's the sender, then um, you definitely can have a config file. That's, that's best practice. But if you have multiple people, they're not all going to be able to, to edit the questions in the question editor at the same time. And we'll show next week, actually the following week, how to map your questions uh, to a SharePoint list. And then we'll show how to map it to the SQL database the week after that. Um, if you have a lot of people filling out the form, we call these responders um, or responses, right? Each, each 
the user is filling it out once or assuming that's the response. If you've got hundreds of them, uh, email is and SharePoint lists are sufficient. Once you get over, you know, 50 or 60,000 responses, you're going to want to think about making it a, an InfoPath web part so it doesn't require the, the filler. Obviously, if you've got a thousand users, not all of them will have InfoPath on the client. So you'll want to use the browser to display the survey. And you'll also probably want to move the data into SQL because SharePoint will have some limitations once you get beyond 40 or 50,000 rows. So those are the three best practices I went over last week. I've gone over there again. No change. Um, last week, you'll recall, um, we had a simple email yes-no question. So we had uh, yes-no was the only type of the answer that we had last week. Um, and this week, what we've done is we have extended this to add an answer type. So we actually have four answer types now. And this is data driven. So some of the questions can be yes, no. Some of them can be check boxes. And um, it's determined based on your question editor. Um, no, the, the question, Kevin, uh, is, and I'm going to answer questions at the end, too, but I'll just answer yours right now since I just saw it. Um, we have a question from Kevin here in the chat window. If you can't see his question, you can, you can click on the IM button at the top. But Kevin's question is, will the web part require uh, 365 or SharePoint server? Um, actually, yes, the, the, the Infopath Forum Services does require SharePoint, and it's SharePoint 2010 or 2007. And SharePoint 2010 is the basis for Office 365. So to answer your question, yes, that is the case. Now, there are a bunch of other technologies out there that will allow you to, to display the InfoPath form in the browser. Um, but none of them are really anywhere near the functionality that Microsoft has provided. Um, so you're, you're not going to be able to use them probably for this, uh, this kind of a form. Because this form, is, this form has got a kind of a complex view. Let's take a look at this here. Once again here, so I've got, um, this is my designer version of the, um, this is the designer for the filler. When I say filler, what I mean is the survey form that people are going to fill out. And you can see here that, you know, I don't have the title here. That's because the title is filled in automatically. And, and when I open the form up, that's the question editor. This is the question editor again. Let me just go back to the, so this is the filler. So if I preview this. You'll see that um, I have a title coming in, and this is coming in from the uh, the questions that XML file, um, and the, the title can change. And we talked about this last week. That was one of the techniques I highlighted last week. And what we're doing uh, to change the title like that is we're just using a calculated value. You can see here in the upper left-hand corner. If I right-click this, you'll see that that's a calculated value, and the property is survey name. But I'm actually getting that survey name from the secondary data source. So you can see here, actually we're getting it from the main data source, um, but the secondary data source is where we're, we're copying it over. So um, it's just pulling the value out of the survey name field. If we look at the survey name field in the main data source, you'll see that we're actually um, automatically setting that survey name equal to the survey name that was used in the secondary data source. Um, so that's why you don't see a tile at the top. Now, if you look at this carefully here, I want to show you how we're doing these different answer types. So last week, we just had the yes-no. Actually, it was a checkbox last week. Um, sorry, so you can see here the second one here, um, the one to the right of my cursor, the yes checkbox. That was what we had last week. And you can see that this week, we've added uh, a text field, a radio button, and a date control. And what we're doing with each one of these is they're all bound to the same thing on the right. They're all, they're all bound. These controls are, are different types of controls, right? One of them is a text, one of them is a checkbox, one of them is a radio button, and one of them is a date control. And they're all bound to the same field here uh, in the main data source. And that's why we're getting that little blue pop-up. It says here that the control stores duplicate data, which is just totally fine. It's just a warning. And what we're doing here is, even though answer type is actually a string, if you look at it over here, it's just a text field, you can bind any kind of control to it. And what we've done is just added these different controls. Now, we don't want to display them all at once. We only want to display the one that corresponds to the answer type for that question. So what we, what we have here is we have a rule. 
on these. And every single one of them has a hide rule. And what we're doing is we're hiding the control. If the, um, the question type, the answer type, is not equal to um, a value. And in this case, the last one, we're hiding it if the answer data type is not equal to date picker. Um, and this is really how you do it. And you know, once, you, uh, once you add the control, you can add this value here. And it's basically just an expression. And this expression may, may seem foreign to you. It may seem like, well, how did he get that? And, um, you know, it's really not that hard. Let me show you. So we're going to just basically recreate this from scratch here. What I'm going to do is, is add conditional um, formatting. Well, let me do it from one of the other ones. I'll do it for this one here. So we've got the hide there, but let's just add it again. And this is going to be formatting, right? So we're going to call this hide2. Make sure your rule names are well named. A lot of, we see a lot of forms come in that have rule 1, rule 2, rule 3. It doesn't really help you try to figure out, um, you know, if you hand off your form to somebody else down the road, they won't know what you meant. So make sure your, your names are meaningful here. Just like your field names in your data source should all be named with meaningful names. Um, so we're going to add a condition now. And once again, here's a condition control, right? So we're just going to go in here and select the field. And this is going to give us this, uh, this dialog here. Defaults to the main data source. And um, that's fine. That's what we're going to use. Actually, um, in this case, we're going to use the secondary data source. We're going to switch to the secondary data source, and uh, is that right? Is that what I want to do? Um, drill down to question. Actually, I think what I want to do, let me just make sure I'm doing it the right way here. <laughs> um, yeah, we're using the secondary data source, that's correct. And we have to filter it. Okay, got it. Okay, so let me try this again here. So once again, I've got my, my second hide here, and I'm going to add a condition. And that condition is going to be uh, to select a field in my secondary data source. And I'm just going to drill down on the questions. And we're going to get the answer data type. We're going to, um, yeah, so um, notice here that you cannot add a filter for this because it's in a condition. And, and this is... Uh, I'm glad I'm, I'm uh, hitting the wall here because I'm going to show you how we did this. But um, the, the way you have to do this then is you actually have to add the condition in a different way. And um, it's easy to do this. So, you know, obviously, the um, first step is to go back like I was doing, select the, uh, the field that you want to get from the secondary data source. In this case, it's going to be that. Answer data type. Now we want to filter that. We want to say we only want the answer data type where the question is equal to the current number. Um, but we don't have the filter button here. So how do we do it? Well, we just leave it like this, okay? And um, and we just say um, is equal to, and then we add in um, some text. So in this case, it's going to be I think text field. I think. I don't know if it's text type or text field, but let's just assume it's text. Okay, now we've got it, right? But this isn't it, because what we really want is we want to filter it, right? So what we have to do is we have to go in here and click on it again. Now, there it is. It's perfect, right? So we can go in here. We can actually select the expression, and that gives us the full X path here. And then what we can go in is we can go in here, and we can add the filter. Now, the filter is always going to be between square brackets. So you're just going to add the filter in, and it's going to be, um, I think it's going to be something like my you know, question number equals, and then you're going to pick the question number from the, um, from the current um, main data source. And if you're unsure how to do that, um, what you can do is you can just add a, a rule here and just say, well, I don't know what it is. Okay, fine. Then you can, um, you know, you can just like type in a number here. And then you just, what you do, is um, is you just change this to the expression, and then you know what the XPath is for your question, um, and that's how you uh, determine it. So you can just copy it into this filter expression. So let's take a look at that first one again. Now here you can see there's a long. We've, we've taken it. It looks exactly like the other one. So we're actually filtering the question. 
not the question, not the answer type, the question where the um, question number is equal to the current question that we have selected in the main data source and the question number for that. So this is very, it's a little bit complicated, not, not very, it's a little bit complicated and um, what you need to do just is make sure that when you when you add these conditions, you don't have to open up the form in the, in the um, you, know, you don't have to take the form and export the source files and open up the manifest. You don't have to do that. All you have to do is, is add it and then switch to the expression and then go in here and manually type in the values for your form. And you're always going to have something of this format where you're, you're comparing the question number in the secondary data source, right? That's the NS here, NS1. That's namespace, right? With the, the question number in our main data source. And that's how you filter it. And that's basically saying, look, you know, is the answer data type for the question that I currently have selected, is that equal to text field? And if it is, hide, if, if it's not equal, hide, hide the control. Now we could do also another thing. We could actually copy the answer data type into the main data source, like we're doing with these other questions. But then you have this extra field in your main data source, and it's not, it's not so clean. Okay, so that's how you do answer types. Um, and we're going to show you next week how to do drop downs, which are just another type of answer. Um, the, the other thing that uh, we've done this week is we've actually added a conditional question. So, so let's take a look at that um, again here. Now here, what we, we here's our filler form again, and I'm going to why did I do that? I didn't mean to do that. Sorry. Let's open this up one more time here. Okay, so here's our filler form again, and um, what we've done is we've uh, we've added a conditional. Uh, formatting here, um, at the, and we just add a rule for that. And this this condition is basically is do another co complex comparison. It's all completely out of the box. All I need to do is figure out how to do it once. I can do it over and over again. But here you can see that we've got two expressions here. We've got one expression that is actually um, checking to see if that question, um, if the condition for the question is is not equal to blank. So in other words, if there is a condition um, and that condition is is uh, is set, then we want to hide it. Okay. So the the first the first expression here is checking to see if the answer value is true, if there's something in the answer value, and if there is, and, and the second condition is checking to see if, if there is a um, a condition question number. Um, so we're using that condition question number, I believe, in this first one here. Let's see here, where is it? So if we look, it's kind of hard to see these sometimes. And so what I recommend you do is just copy them into Notepad so you can look at them a little bit easily, more easily. That's what we're going to do here. So I copy that first expression in here, and even in Notepad, you know. Things can get pretty long. So this one, this expression here, this is kind of a, a tricky XPath expression. Um, once again, we're filtering it. That square bracket there is a filter. So the, and it ends. Where does it end? Well, it, it goes all the way down to here. So that's the filter. Um, and the filter has got a filter in it. So it's it's really a, an advanced XPath here. So within the filter. We're saying, look, I want to get the question where the question number is equal to the, um, the number that corresponds to the same exact condition that we saw in the previous one. But we also, we're, we're here, what we're doing is we're actually selecting um, where the question number is equal to the, uh, the condition question number. Kind of complex. You can take a, a look at this more deeply and send me an email if you have questions and we can kind of walk you through it in more detail. Um, but since we're running out of time today, I'm not going to spend much more time on it. Just to show you, though, that you can set up this, this condition. And this condition is, is checking, in the end, checking, well, if the answer for that question, 
that I'm relying on, if that answer is equal to the answer value, in other words, if the, you know, the condition can be anything, right? The condition can say, well, if the, if the answer is 5 for the views, then I want you to show the question. So let's see how that works. Let's go into our, our questionnaire again, and let's add a value here. So we've got um, most of these values that we have for conditions are simply set to, to no. Um, but let's, let's change one here. Um, so we have um, a text field here, and let's just see if we can find one that's dependent on one that is not a yes-no. And I think we have one at the bottom here. Um, so how many, of form, uh, how many views does the form have? So this one is, uh, does the form have any views? And that's a yes-no, so we can't use that. But we can, let's see, I think we can probably use the XML files to be stored on SharePoint. So that's, that's another um, yes-no question. So we're, we're basically, our conditionality is, is based on the yes-no right now, but you could have a condition where we say, look, I want to um, add a condition for the views, how, how many views does the form have? And if it has um, more than, if it's equal to two, we'll show this one. So let's just uh, save this out. And we'll just save it out as questions two. And we'll load it into our filler form. Once again, go to data connections. Just going to replace the questions we have in there with the new one. And now if we preview it, uh, if we go down to the bottom here, one of these questions is based on the number of views. So if we add the views here, make it two, we should see what was it two or three? I forget. There is three. What version of SharePoint? Okay, so that's kind of how you're doing the conditioning. And, and as the answers change, the, the, the questions will display differently. That's conditional questions. And then finally, I want to show you a technique that you can use. Um, this is kind of interesting, but if you take their form here, and this is a this is our filler form. And if you export it as source files, you'll be able to actually go in and extract the XML. And the first time you send an email form, what you need to do is just send them the XSN. So you've finished your filler form, you're done with it, you're going to save it out, and then you're going to send the, the XSN in email to your constituents. Um, and when they get the email, they will simply double-click it, and they'll be able to fill out the form because it's an email form. It's very important for these email forms that your security be set to restricted. Otherwise, you cannot send the XSN in email. Um, but there's one more technique here that I want to show you, and that is underneath the Publish button in the File tab, there is a command to export the source files. And I've done this, um, and what, I, what happens when you export the source files is you, you have to specify a folder, and you export them all. And this, basically, it takes all of the pieces, all of the files that, that make up your form template and extracts them into a separate folder. So here you can see we've got the manifest, we've got the data source, um, the views. And some of you may not have seen this before. Well, each InfoPath form is, is comprised of a bunch of different files, images, files, you can see the PNGs there, data source, um, data connections, there's the questions, XML we added, there's a schema, a data source for the questions, there's sample data, and there's the template. Now, once you extract it, what you can do is you can simply um, copy the template XML out, and you can use that as, um, as a substitute uh, for sending the survey. You don't have to send them the XSN every time. You can just send them a template XML. And that's kind of how SharePoint works when you open a form. Um, so what I've done is I've just extracted that, uh, that template XML here, and you would just send this file to them. Now, when I double-click on this file, well, first of all, let me show you that the, the form is not installed on anyone's computer because we're just sending the XSN an email, right? So what you're going to see here is that, that there's, um, there's, no, um, there's no HTTP here. Let me just do word wrap. Um, the href here is just set to manifest. So usually with a form that's published to SharePoint, the, the top of your, your XML form will have the location 
of where the form is published. But in this case, it doesn't because we're just emailing the form around, um, which is fine because once they, they double click on the form once, they've got it cached locally. So they can just double click on the template XML and it will open the form. And it's just opening it um, once again from the computer. Um, and uh, Okay, so that's it for my quick demo. I'm just going to switch back to my slide deck real quick. Um, next week we're doing more complex email with SharePoint upload. Uh, the following week we'll be doing the browser-based uh, surveys with the questions, editing those questions via a SharePoint list. Then on, on uh, part five, we're going to be looking at reporting using lists. So we have multiple lists that we're going to report on. We have a list for surveys, a list for answers, a list for responders. And we'll be doing a more complex report based on those lists. So we're mapping the InfoPath form to those lists, and then we're, we're reporting on them. And then finally, at, at the final here, the end, we will uh, they show you how to do database reporting using uh, the same types of survey forms. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, please go ahead and contact us. Just put in your information here, email, so we know how to contact you, um, so we can send you the samples that I did on today. And I'll send you those samples along with the presentation deck. Um, and next week, like I said, we're doing survey forms part three. Uh, so I'll answer questions now. We've got a question from Ralph. Is there any upper limit for the number of questions per questionnaire? For example, 50 questions per questionnaire. Um, no, there wouldn't be. Uh, what you would do is, um, once, as, once again, um, if you have a lot of questions, you're going to generate a lot of, you know, a lot of data. And that data, you'll need to report on it in some way. You know? um, and you know, the other thing you would probably want to do is not display all the questions in one view. The best practice is to kind of render the survey as people fill it out. If you present them with 50 questions, they're going to say, well, I don't want to fill out the survey. It's going to take too long. So you can do paging. You can give them five questions per page, and that way they don't know there's 50. There's just 10 pages. You can kind of give them a progress indicator that shows them how far along they are. Um, you don't want to show all 50 questions necessarily in the browser form. Um, the, the browser form has some performance limitations, you know, in SharePoint, if you have 100 or 200 questions and you're trying to show all those in one full swoop, then it's not going to perform so, so quickly. In fact, there may be some issues with that. So I would recommend that you hide them or use paging. Um, and I can show you those techniques um, in a future webinar. Paging is, we've done paging for quite a few, quite a few forms. We've got samples on InfoPath Dev that show you how to do paging. In fact, Greg Collins created a sample um, about two or three years ago that shows how to do paging. You can also use separate views and just have the questions on the view. But, but to make it dynamic um, so that you can change the size of the page, you're going to want to look at Greg's sample on InfoPath Dev. Um, last week's sample seemed to be limited to 50 items. Um, yeah, so let me just explain one thing here that I didn't explain. So that, that's a good point. Um, what we're using here for this sample, if we go back to the, uh, the home tab, is we're using default data. And the reason why is because we're copying those values from the secondary data source into the main data source. And so what we've done is here is we've added these 50 questions here. So all you have to do um, to extend it, Ralph, is just go into default data and just add a few more questions here. You know, just, what you just do is just like add. Now, you know, obviously, the default data um, you know, you can add 200 in here or something. It's just a pain to do this, but you can do it and to, to extend the number. Um, and you know, I'm glad you found that out. But what we're going to be showing you, I think, on part five is how to do it dynamically so you don't have to use default data. But right now, you're, you're right. The default values, uh, we've only added, by default, 50 questions. But it's easy for you to extend it. You just go in here to default values and you just keep on adding them, right, and then until you have 100 or something. Um, and, and then it will show more. Does that answer your question? Hopefully. Any other questions? Um, okay, another question from Ralph here. Last week you sent um, the questionnaire to yourself before you sent it out. Why did you do that? Well, the, the key thing here is in Outlook, um, you have to, when you create a, uh, uh, a folder in Outlook and you, and you associate it with an InfoPath form, that form has to be cached locally on your computer so that it can tell. 
um, which form it is. So last week, you'll recall, um, I had a survey folder. And in order for me to associate this folder, you see it's an InfoPath survey folder. In order for me to associate this with an InfoPath form, that InfoPath form has to be cached locally. Okay, so it has to be a form that I've recently used. And that's the reason why I sent it to myself first. Your users, they don't, they don't care, right? Because they're going to just open up the form from email, double-click it to open it, fill it out, and send it to you. They're, they don't have a folder on their computers. Only you, as kind of the survey administrator, will have a folder. And, and that's only you need to be able to associate that folder with the InfoPath form. And the only way you can do that is if the form is recently used. And that's why I sent it to myself. Does that answer your question? Hopefully it does. Great questions, by the way. Anyone else have questions for me? We've got a few minutes remaining here. And uh, we're here to answer any questions you have. Um, we are doing surveys this month. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of new techniques coming up in the weeks ahead. Don't forget to uh, give us a shout out, give us some feedback. Um, you can send email to us using this contact us page and uh, just tell us, you know, if, uh, if we're doing an okay job, if we can improve in any way, we will. And uh, I don't hear, any, if I don't see any questions, uh, I will, uh, oh, there's one, Kevin's typing a question here. You know, you've got me here at your disposal, so if you have any questions, you know, now's the time to, to ask them. Um, we'll just wait a minute here for Kevin to finish typing. Um, and uh, if you've got quick feedback, you know, another thing you can do is you can just type it into the chat and you can let us know. So Kevin's got an off-topic question. Do we have the editor extensibility like we did in Visual Studio? I'm not quite sure I understand what you mean um, by extensibility. Um, we have created data-driven design, and i um, not quite sure um, what editor extensibility means means in this context, so I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to stop recording here so we can uh, um, take this uh, video and convert it into a WMV file. And uh, while we have a couple more questions coming in, I'm just going to stop the recording. It's been wonderful having you here today. I've got more questions I'm going to answer in a second. I just want to stop the recording here first. And, uh